One note is Greg Donato, who is the partner and chief creative officer at Deutsch New York, um, could not be with us here today uh, due to a last minute situation in New York. But we have representing Deutsch, Jamie Maltash, Correct. who uh, I was told is uh, natively digital. So I'm very intrigued <laughs> by that. But I know you're, you're a key part of the interactive division at Deutsch. Um, a, an advertising firm that has been associated uh, and represented clients such as Microsoft and PNC and Unilever, um, and I know Volkswagen and, and many others. Uh, we also have with us Michael Hughes, who is the president of the Martin Agency. Um, Mike has been uh, hailed by Adweek as one of the nine best creative directors in America. Uh, his agency is one of the best creative agencies in the world, according to Adweek and AdAge and many others. Um, his clients, uh, his firm's clients, include uh, Geico, Comcast, and Walmart, and I'm sure none of us have seen any Geico ads recently. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's terrific work. I want to, uh, before starting the conversation, play uh, an ad or two, if we're ready, uh, John, that are quite different from the others we've seen today. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. We've got a little network going here, and uh, it was very easy to set up. We speak each other's language. We share our internet connection. There are all sorts of things we do together. Who now, who's this now? What's... Oh, going? this is that new digital camera from Japan. Just came out. Hajimemashite. Uh, Hajimemashite. Yoroshiku onegashimasu. Wait, 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 wait. You speak her language? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everything just kind of works with a Mac. Uh, ah, arigato. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. So, 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 Do we have one more? Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. And I feel inadequate. Okay. PCs get viruses. We can't do as much out of the box. I don't know why you're so hard on yourself. I don't get it. Mac, why don't you say something positive about PC? Okay, easy. PC, you are a wizard with numbers and you dress like a gentleman. PC? Well, Mac, I, I guess you are a little better at creative stuff. Well, thank you. That's Even though nice. it's completely juvenile and a waste of time. <laughs> Maybe you should come in twice a week. <laughs> So the reason I, I uh, chose to, to show those, and, and this, was, uh, this is on me, uh, was to dispel a little bit the idea that there is ne no such thing as negative advertising in the business realm as opposed to the political realm. Uh, because obviously those are, th that campaign that uh, many of you, most of you will have been familiar with, uh, was a, a pretty edgy, comparative, you know, negative take. But again, it feels very different. Uh, from all of the political ads that we've seen here today. So, Mike, if you could just get us going by talking about uh, the extent to which you feel there are such negative, adver you know, such negative advertising exists when one business takes on another, um, and why is it that perhaps we see a lot less of it than we do in the political sphere? Uh, do we see less of it than we used in the past? I, don't, I, don't, I admit I don't have a historical take there. What I think happens is, in our business, we tend to say that what we do is we build sales overnight and brand over time. And so we care about both of those things, building the overnight sales and building the long-term brand. And so when you come away from those Apple and Mac ads, you kind of like Apple, you kind of like the Mac. And um, they, he might be pretty tough, the commercials themselves might be pretty tough on their competition, you come away liking them. Pepsi all, often has taken on um, Coke over the years, but they do it no, tongue-in-cheek, and you come away liking them. I think the difference is political advertising is rarely built to build a brand over time. It, it built, it's for that one day of the primary vote and that one day of the election, and then everybody's on their own again. And so you come away... Um, you come away thinking, well, this helps me with my choice because I know I don't want to vote for that flip-flopper or that person who took that stand. And it makes that immediate connection. But after a while, you don't feel as good about the people who are doing it. So we don't feel as good about our politicians as we do about Apple. We don't feel as good about our politicians as we do about Pepsi. And um, 
And I think that's an inevitable result of going for the one-time sale at any cost. In Jane Meyer's wonderful New Yorker article, she, talk, uh, she quotes Carter Eskew as saying, if you're in this business, you have to figure out if I don't, my sponsor, if I don't um, win this election, I die. Well, all these things, they, they rev up the emotion like it's Armageddon if you vote for the wrong person. And they go for that one day vote as opposed to building a long term meaningful brand. I think the exception in the last 30 years was uh, Reagan's Morning in America. I think that actually helped his long term brand because it was pretty positive. Uh, on the Coke Pepsi uh, example that we provocatively just threw in the headline for this segment, I am thinking as you were as you were alluding to it, I was thinking of the Super Bowl ads, where the uh, a Pepsi ad I think it was for Pepsi Max, where they show the Coke distributor trying to sneak a Pepsi in the store, and all of the cans come down, and or I think this year's iteration, the Coke guy wins some sweepstakes, and all the Pepsi people come out, and he's sort of mortified. So. Uh, do you have to have, is there some kind of unwritten rule, or maybe it's even written somewhere in your handbooks that it, there has to be humor if you're going to go negative? It's Jamie, just, do you have? You know, I think your point about the long-term branding is really important. A negative advertising for a politician can just bring down their negatives, and that's fine, and that's why we see the trend for negative political advertising to go to those third-party groups, non-attributed, not to the campaigners. For Good us, point. when we've got to defend a brand, we want a brand to stay likable, and it's very rarely a binary choice. So we talk about Coke versus Pepsi, but I'm just as likely to go buy Gatorade or to buy orange juice. And it's not a forced choice that an election is. And because of that, we've got a different need to keep you liking the brand and keep you liking the ad. And I think humor is one of the tools that we use to get some bite. You know, Usually it's satire. It gets a message across, but it keeps the brand likable. You don't want it to blow back on you. It's a lot of, we talked a lot about blowback in the earlier panel. And blowback is one of the big reasons that brands don't go negative more often. We do do it, but we use it as a much more controlled technique, and it's a lot through inference. So I think of the Southwest ads that take on the big airline industries, but never mention a Delta, never mention an American they, Airlines. Fake airline names. There's Skyline, I think, is the ad that charges for bags. Like, they don't even want to mention one of the Delta or American. Right, it's to avoid that binary choice. It's to just make the point and leave the takeaway about your brand, but not necessarily always to have the negativity associated with it. Well, in, in one of the earlier discussions, Ken Goldstein made the point that uh, this has not been the case this cycle, but it, historically, primary fights were more civil, particularly when you had five or six candidates, maybe for the reason that you alluded to. He mentioned, as an example, 2004, when uh, Gephardt and Howard Dean then in Iowa did a pretty good job of destroying each other to the benefit of John Edwards and John Kerry. Uh, so I guess, I guess that's part of the dynamic that, that you're talking about. Uh, but are there examples of, uh, this is to, to both of you, of other negative campaigns or comparative campaigns in the commercial space that have, you know, pro might, might provide uh, good lessons and models for political candidates? There's a um, famous case back in the 1950s when people were getting into pressure cooking and slow, slow cooking through pressure cookers. And there was a case where one or two of the pressure cookers blew up. And the maker of that pressure cooker ran a full page ad in the paper and said, will not blow up. <laughs> and nobody bought a pressure cooker for five years because they hadn't even heard that you know, there's one or two cases. So it can come back and bite you. It can come back and bite you. But um, um, I, it it's, like be. Airli it's like airlines don't advertise about the fact that there were no crashes last right. year. Right, yeah. Which is an astonishing feat, but it's not one that's Well, it's a mutually assured destruction thing. The, the reason they don't do that is, God forbid they should crash the next week, the right. next month, that that would be thrown in. And I think there's a lot of keeping your powder dry for brands that rather than risk the gotcha back and forth, um, they will choose not to advertise. I think what, what's happening more and more is that it's light comparison. So political advertising feels like it's gone to the extreme, super negative, super quick. Um, for brand advertising, I'm intrigued watching premium car brands, so the Audi and BMWs. And in the rise of Audi, Audi is taking on BMW and trying to deposition them as a premium choice, but doing so through humor, doing so through promoting their brand, not by going all the way negative, not by saying that is a bad car, just our car is better now. 
And I think that kind of argument works better in the commercial arena than it would in the, in the presidential arena. We are amazed in our, as we watch some of the Allstate and State Farm commercials that take on Geico these days, because it was just unbelievable that those huge companies would take on little Geico, Geico 10 years ago, client, right? our client. And, Full disclosure. And so when, yes, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so when they do that, um, we don't try to respond. We, uh, we think, oh, I can't believe we're in this same commercial with these people. And they sometimes <laughs> call us Geico, and they sometimes call us the 15-minute company or something like that. <laughs> and um, I think, I think that has actually helped raise the level of humanity in that whole category. I think the whole category, where they used to tell you you had to buy this insurance if you loved your children. And now it's, no, get the one that makes the most sense financially and don't make it so heavy. And, and do, you do you find that you often have to talk uh, clients out of mixing it up more? Do they come to you sometimes saying, you know, I, we can't believe that the, uh, this other fast food chain is charging, you know, 25 cents more for their burger, let's go after them, and you have to talk them out of it, or, or do people, are people, are they averse to it, and, and on the contrary, you have to push them into some comparison? Look, clients love their brands, you know, and, and we love their brands for them. So often, they believe fervently that they have the better product or the better brand. So often, they'll want to draw out that distinction and make that argument. I think the decision calculus for us is what will most effectively sell your product and sell your brand, and to Mike's earlier point, sell it for the long term, not just the short term. There's always a cheap, quick get that might get people in store, get them to buy your product, but does that sustain a vision for the product that gets you to buy it the second time, the third time? The other thing that I think is really important in terms of differences between political advertising and commercial is the time frame. One of the things that as an ad guy in the commercial world, I've been blown away this cycle more than most is the speed of response and the speed of TV advertising. It feels like there's the rise of this new Insta ad where literally 30 minutes or 45 minutes after a debate ends, I'm watching on YouTube an ad cut by the campaign either rebutting or promoting something negative that was said. And that speed to market belies what could happen on the commercial side, just the layers of approval. Because how long would that cycle be in, in, in the real world that you operate in? Well, one thing that happens a lot is a chairman of a company gets really angry at their competitor and says, I want an ad that says this and this. But by the time it comes back to us and goes back through their lawyers, <laughs> 20 people have said, you're not going to do that. You're not going <laughs> to do that. And, and it comes back because um, we can do things very quickly but not many big corporations are built to handle them quickly. They can't go through. Right. Um, his agency or mine could do an ad for you overnight, but you couldn't get it approved. Um, I mean, I've, I've done ads in as little as 10 days. You know, I've done digital ads in a day, but the approval cycle or, orphan dwarfs. The amount of time it takes you to make the ad is the amount of time it takes you to get approved. And I think that's the difference. Political campaigns, by their nature, have a boss. And when the boss says go, you can go. That's often not true of the world of brands and right. the world of commercial advertising. And we're more concerned about being taken to court for not saying something true. It's an important distinction. We don't have the same First Amendment protections to say anything. You know, when you're representing a brand and a public company or even a private company, you've got a much greater challenge to meet the fair standard. Is what you're saying true? You know, does it defy FTC rules? And I think that that level of scrutiny means that the comparisons we make are often more valid or at least more clear. Yes, it was, I think it was, there was some question earlier about the, whether there are checks and balances and, and uh, remedies in the political re sphere, and, and there are. I mean, libel laws apply. But the, the bar and the burden of proof is quite different when you're talking about public figures. Um, and also, there was conversation earlier about the, the extent to which local broadcasters assert their power to say, you know, we don't think this, this flies factually. And they often don't want to get in that business for obvious reasons. Um, so it's, it's true. I, I was wondering about, um, you know, we talked a lot about the phenomenon of independent groups. In this cycle, it's super PACs that are empowered by Citizens United. You know, Eight years ago, it was the 527s. There always seems to have been these independent, unaffiliated groups that can go a lot nastier um, for reasons that you've also alluded to, that there's some blowback effect to the candidate or the brand itself if it's the, involved in the negative messaging. And I suppose we don't really have anything akin to that unaffiliated third party that can go nuclear in the commercial space. But I'm wondering if that 
might be changing or might change with, with the, you know, you, you, you Jamie, are, are natively digital. Uh, so are there kind of guerrilla campaigns yeah, that... Yeah, speak if ever there was any. <laughs> are, there, are, there, are, there, are there sort of guerrilla campaigns that brands can engage in by not with the spot that you see in the Super Bowl, but something that's happening online that's very targeted that might begin to resemble this notion, the dynamic of having an, an, an arm's length with a group that can get more negative. Yeah, we, we talk often about branded and unbranded campaigns. So often a company will launch an unbranded to campaign to either seed or unseen a point of view or perspective. Um, the pharma world does it a lot. So pharmaceutical drug might want you to you know, start to take interest in a bladder disorder. And that might be an unbranded ad, which allows them a little more latitude in what they could say about bladder disorder. And then that might be followed by a branded advertisement for their bladder solution having paved the way with an unbranded. So I think there's definitely an analog in our commercial world for branded and unbranded. In terms of attack, I don't know that I think there's a perfect analog, but certainly in the Southwest example and many others, we will take on a mythical company or a theoretical company, and it's lost on no one who we're attacking. I think those are the right. two analogs for me. I, th I think there's a sensitivity that um, people feel in corporations that, for example, um, our Walmart client is always very sensitive to the fact that they can't feel, feel like bullies. They can't be out there saying, we're be doing the sustainability thing. What they have their customers say is the customers say, look, if all 200 million Walmart shoppers, if we all do this, it'll make a difference. And the cu customers get credit for it. Because some, a big company like Walmart has to worry about the, the whole perception. And there aren't other people um, who are going to come to Walmart's rescue for that kind of thing when, when it's unfairly charged with something. I think the notion of bullies is really important, analog, different from the advertising world. You know, Ken talked a bunch about there being rough parity between Republicans and Democrats, most cycles with spend. That's not true of the commercial world, and that's certainly not true in many of our categories. There's a lead competitor, there's a number two, and often there's a great distance between those top one or two competitors and everybody else. So we don't have that same burden of ask and answer or ask and response. And I think that changes very often as the leader what you're willing to say. You know, from some of the earlier examples, often the leader doesn't want to respond to the guy that's at 5%, even if he makes a negative right. ad. And often, you know, on the other side, I've done the challenger ads and been thrilled when someone responds. You know, many years ago, we did some printer work that was meant to provoke HP that was the dominant leader in printer. And when HP responded to our 1% share player with their 80 plus percent share, it was a win. They were talking about our printers and getting reporters and tech reporters to consider buying that printer, or at least was the printer better. So that's one of the differences is that right. there's not real parity. It's what you can afford to spend, and that's driven very often by market share. Right. Well, I think one of the big differences that Sid Myers and his partners out there, one of the reasons they're heroes to everyone in our business is not just what they did with the Daisy ad, but their agency created a kind of humanity for advertising. That Volkswagen ad. That Volkswagen ad. And his agency's Volkswagen ad in the Super Bowl last year with the kid as Darth Vader. The Darth Vader. The, there is still that humanity, that great humanity that our clients want to own. And um, the politicians you know, it is a tough business, and they do have to be thick-skinned. Yeah, have the, you ever done political ads? Either one of you? I have not. No. I did um, back in the 70s, a long time ago. Um, we got a call from a billionaire, a guy who's in the 150, top 150 people in the Forbes billionaire list, a couple months ago asking us, I like your Geico ads. I want to go after Barack Obama. Um, would you guys do this? And um, it took my partner and me a couple minutes to say, no, we're not going to do that. And it's, you know, when I, so I sit out there and I hear two and a half billion dollars. I said, why don't I do that? <laughs> and um, I said, but it's not the kind of business that you'd feel good about in the morning, you know? Um, and um, is that the reason or? or is it just that if you're in one business, it's hard to get into the other because you might want well, to offend your, there, your there corporate clients? Or, or both. Uh, both of us are, have the same parent company, and um, um, 
uh, the parent company doesn't let us do political advertising. In part for which corporate is good. customers you're talking about. So right. our clients presumably occupy a broad range of political points of view, and mm -hmm. the last thing they want is their agency you know, right. to represent only one point of view, and then all of a sudden in the commercial world, you've limited your client set to those conservative companies or to those progressive companies. So it's also a bad business, I think, as much as. We, ha um, we encourage our people to work on their own outside of the agency on political campaigns and even give them some time off. But we don't dictate what their policy, sh what their politics should be. I asked earlier if uh, politic, you know, if you had, if you could point to political, uh, I'm sorry, commercial ad campaigns that politicians can learn from. Um, when you look at political advertising, and, and we've seen a, a lot today dating back to uh, those incredibly painful Eisenhower ads. Uh, do you see, do you pick up ideas or trends that, that might translate, or are they just so binary and so black and white and so vicious that you just kind of laugh at them? I definitely think how they're using some of that quick turn, some of that instant response, some of that micro-targeting. I think there's a bit of a feedback loop between the commercial side and the political side. You know, I'm struck this cycle by the lack, though, of branding. So commercial advertising is so much about building a brand over time. And when I look at Obama's success in winning that election, to me, part of what he did was build such a strong brand all the way through the primaries. You know, the Democratic convention served to really relaunch that brand. And it, to me, it carried him through election. And this cycle, I don't see any kind of consistency from any of these candidates in how they want to show up. And I think that's an analog from our world that feels to me like sorely missing in the political world. It's very today's fight, you know, today's need versus that kind of longer term view. I'm not a fan of Ron Paul, but I do think his advertising has been the best. Mm -hmm because he has a consistency about him, uh, which I personally think is crazy, but, uh, but um, to the point he, where he, the, the he's debate. on point, and his messages are on point. And um, I think it's, um, I, you can understand why so many people find that attractive. And um, it's an interesting question. There's a believability. I mean, there's a reason that we don't encourage brands to change their campaign every six months or every year. And there's a reason that Tony the Tiger is still Tony the Tiger, that we build you know, what a logo looks like and what even commercials look like. And we change them very carefully and relatively slowly because that familiarity is what builds favorability. And I think that familiarity is not happening for some of these political candidates, in part because they keep changing their message. And I think you're dead right. Ron Paul has been super consistent. I feel like I know what I'm going to see in his ads, and I know what statements, even in the debates, I know when he's going to hop up you know, and lose his cool. And I think that that really works to tell those voters that are going to vote for him what they should vote for him based on. And I think some of the others, and this is, I think, a really interesting thing. The rise of social media means they don't get to say one thing in Kansas and another in Florida right. and a different thing in Iowa. And I think that's been true in our commercial world for a long time because most of the brands are national. It feels relatively new, even to presidential politics, that that stuff is so easily dispersed. The Iowa pander hurts you in Florida a month later. Right. It's funny, in the last debate, I don't know if you saw Ron Paul, I think it was debate number 20, when uh, CNN, the moderator, asked each candidate to define, to define themselves with one word. The one word Ron Paul chose was consistent. So it's uh, interesting to hear you all, uh, pros in the business of branding, seeing that in his messaging, too. Um, is there one commercial, Michael, that, that you wish you had done? That you didn't. I mean, when you what's the in, the in the political? Not in the political world necessarily. In the commercial space, one campaign, one commercial that you admire the most that you say, ah, I wish I had done that. Well, the one that's on everybody's mind these days, or the, yeah. or the two, are the big Apple commercials. The um, think different. Um, wouldn't it be nice if a <laughs> political candidate could could find something that inspiring? Um, and and so I think that. I, I think everybody in our industry loves that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, going back a number of years, the people who, who did the um, Bayer commercial for Reagan and The Morning in America were the same people who did um, uh, the Bartles and James commercials and um, GE brings new good things to life. 
they were some of the really professional, top professional people in our industry. And it shows that maybe people should get, um, maybe agencies like ours <laughs> should be doing this. But when it's unregulated as it is, and the encouragement to exaggerate and take things out of context, right. it's just too uncomfortable for us. What, whatever happened to wine coolers? <laughs> <laughs> I remember those ads, those guys on the porch. <laughs> Jamie, is there something you now we Now we label them the, the liquor so that it sells the liquor on yeah. TV. Yeah. The business has changed. You know, I was struck, you know, I love the Daisy ad. I'm a political junkie, and it was such a transcendent moment in political advertising where it all changed in an instant. And I was struck watching it for the first time in, in a while, the similarity of that Daisy ad in story to 1984, and just that air wants a fundamentally different message, a message that... Again, an, app, the Apple, uh, an Apple ad. But the, just the depth of being able to run a commercial to be re-aired, I think, is something that's not being thought about enough, particularly in this cycle. Um, so much of this stuff is thought of as what are we going to put out there versus what is the response that what we put out there is going to draw, and then what conversation will that response start? And I think the politicians have started to wake up to that game a little bit. It feels like there's, a, there's more than ever before a commercial made for the 9 o'clock hour on cable news, but I think that there's still more need for that kind of response-based advertising instead of stimulus-based. You know, don't tell me what you want to tell me. Let me let me draw my own conclusions. It still feels very hitting on the head for me. I think a takeaway from your conversation for me uh, that I hadn't thought about was the absence of branding that we're seeing in this cycle of advertising in the primary season, where it's quick reaction. It's let's bring down uh, the latest candidate who might have seen a surge in the polls, and I suppose the the candidate that eventually gets the nomination. Is might hope that there might be a, a moment there between that moment and the conventions and the general election season to engage in that positive branding. It'll be interesting to watch that going forward. Um, but that, that insight that you provided is, is really uh, helpful. And I, you have something to say, Jamie, then yeah. I do want to open it up to comments I think and it's questions. worth saying we've built in some systemic branding vehicles. So very consciously, after the election, when it's all over, we do a dramatic inauguration and we do a dramatic run up in the when inauguration. When you say we, you don't. We, the country. The country. The country. And the reason we do that is to make the president the president, to make the president above this all and above the day to day politics. So I think branding is important for the candidates, but I think it's equally important that then we take that step back and make them above that ugly mess of politics. And it feels like this is going to be an uglier year, maybe than ever before, maybe not, according right. to Ken. But Interesting to think about the deliberate choice to rebrand the president as the president, not as the candidate we said all those mean things about. Although increasingly, that's, that, I would argue that's happening less, right? The campaign never seems to end. The legitimacy of the president is questioned by the opposition more so than in the past. But, but I, I, I get what you're, we're, that's you're saying about this. the most insidious part of this, is that now candidates for their whole life have to be careful that they're always against the other side. And um, they, they don't want anything coming back at them. Um, my agency did the commercial with um, Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi that Gingrich now says was the biggest mistake of his life. Um, and what was our goal at that time was, we called it the WE campaign, because we wanted all Americans against global warming. And so explain it, what that ad was for. Uh, uh, Al Gore started the Alliance for Climate Protection. Right. And um, he, he put together a board that was half Republican and half Democrat. Nice. And we competed for the business and we won. And the whole idea of the campaign was that um, we were going to bring both sides together on this. There was some naivety on our part. Um, it is impossible to separate political politics from those things. It's impossible <laughs> to separate politics from Al Gore in most people's minds. So did That's Mitt Romney send you a thank you note? <laughs> <laughs> Let's open it up um, here in the front. Al Milliken, AM Media. Um, what do you know as far as the market research, the scientific study that's done in your commercial world as compared with the political world? And also, um, what influence is there from other nations, other cultures, as far as what works with their advertising and how that has affected or not affected uh, American, I guess particularly political advertising yet? 
Well, I think um, one, thing that's, you know, <laughs> one, th one thing that's happened, the international influences on American advertising, I think we're getting more visual in their storytelling, less based on um, um, articulated positions, and for better and for worse sometimes. Um, I think in politics, it is, um, it is we, we know from a lot of research that consumers are really overwhelmed by choice. If they have all these choices, how do I narrow it down so I can make a decision, so I don't just keep putting the decision, putting it off day after day after day. And the negative things will work better. I, I would be hard pressed if I was doing a political campaign not to tell the person to run the negative ads, because I think that will get them elected faster, because it will help eliminate the competition in that choice procedure. I would run the negative ads, too. To answer the second part of your question, um, the range of research we do for a particular client or for a particular campaign varies greatly, but often it's pretty in-depth focus grouping, so literally gathering a group of the representative target in a room, share either work in progress or final ads, gauge reaction, gauge what's good, what's bad, what's working, what's not working, revise those ads, maybe go back to those focus groups, or even do you know, more of a quantitative testing, so literally put it in front of hundreds and at times thousands of people and understand what works and what doesn't. That's some clients. Another kind of client will look at an ad, look at an idea, say, make me that, um, and want it on air in a week or two. So it really is a big range. I think um, the difference is it feels like the political world shifts a little more quickly. Your perception of brands is pretty ingrained, um, and it will shift, but it won't shift overnight. So we've got a little bit of a longer timeline on which to do that research and to put a campaign in market. Um, for politicians, you know, when I look at the world that Rick Santorum's advertising into this week versus four weeks ago, my God, you know, the ad campaign would, would have been cut you know, four different times in the four weeks based on who we think he is that moment and who he needs to project that he's going to be going forward to win an election. You know, you didn't really have to explain how the process works because we've all watched Mad Men. <laughs> we know how it works. You know, Don Draper calls a couple people into his office and uh, there's an ad next morning. I'm, have I'm you seen a surge like in applications right for <laughs> people wanting to work in, in your firms because of Mad Men? The glamorous life that you all lead, is that? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Well, <laughs> no, not, not just the, the, yeah. the, <laughs> not just the drinking. Uh, it seems like a lot of fun. Um, in the back there in the blue shirt. Mark Brodsky, a retired physicist. Uh, there seems to be one analog in the commercial world to the rapid response, and that's the Super Bowl ads. I mean, the minute the Super Bowl is, at, is over, there's a lot of press response to those ads. How's that changing commercial advertising? And are the Super Bowl ads getting better or worse as a result? I won't say better or worse, but the thing I would tell you is Super Bowl advertising now starts three weeks before the Super Bowl, not the minute the Super Bowl ends. You know, literally, you know, VW a year ago, we released the fourth spot about 10 days before, and it had 10 million hits, viewers on YouTube, before the Super Bowl had ever started. Um, a good percentage of the country had seen it and decided they liked it. And the USA Today poll that's one of the big ones that decide Super Bowl success was in many ways influenced by that social media vote of what was good before. So I do think that there's the Super Bowl is an unusual moment of scrutiny for advertising. We don't care and we don't ask about advertising for the most part. We try and we tell ourselves it doesn't affect us and we don't pay attention. The Super Bowl is the moment where we tune in and watch the ads. So there's become a great game to see whose ads will be effective. So it does change that way. In terms of preparation, just the sheer spend involved in a Super Bowl spot drives a long cycle of what is the right piece of creative that we should put out there. There's also not that many moments on network television anymore where you can get an audience of a billion people. You know, there's only one or two the whole year. So it's a moment to break new news, to break a new t campaign, to launch a new product. So it does, in general, it requires way more preparation than a normal spot. In the front here. Hi, I'm Greg Shuckman, and I uh, just want to thank uh, the foundation. This is fantastic for, for all of us political advertising junkies. Um, the, the one thing I was trying to think about when, when you were talking about Rock'em Sock'em Robots with products is um, Boeing and Lockheed in some of the contracts that were happening here in town recently. Um, but you're right, there's very few where 
they're willing to go head to head um, because of the damage or the blowback that'll come from from something like that. What I what I was curious about was if you apply this to a different industry. Okay, I'm in higher education, and one of the things that we're facing is um, for profits, which is getting a lot of headway because of the the advertising that they're able to spend, and because it sort of overwhelms, probably not unlike what, what State Farm and Allstate thought about Geico, um, just the amount of money that's being thrown out to advertise, does that change perception, and how do you avoid getting blowback as a sector? Because I think that's where some of the, some of the brands try to play is, is, okay, we can't do it head to head, but if I can do it as a sector, if I can do it through a trade group or, a, or an issue advocacy group that's created as a coalition, so I was just wondering if you could talk about that. I have a wife who's a teacher, so I have to be very careful when talking about education. You know, I think the sector, it's a really interesting dynamic, private versus public. I think that there is enough money in the education field, whether it's on the union side supporting public workers or stuff, that there's the ability to land a perception. If, if the discussion was, can we do advertising and can we change perception of the business, I certainly think that's something that's possible. I also think that you know, we're talking about advertising, but we're in the business of marketing, and that transcends advertising and the paid messages we put out there, you know, through social media, through the paid media. There's many ways to land your message, and I think that there's an opportunity for education to get out in front and tell their story a little bit. I think what's happened is educators, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of teachers, lost control of the narrative. And when you lose control of the narrative and you're forced to answer somebody else's narrative, whatever the field is, you're in trouble because then you're left to rebut why are you getting paid so much? Why aren't you measuring instead of here's how successful we are, how can we improve it? So I think part of it is just grabbing control of that narrative. And I would tell you advertising is only one of the ways to do that. I, uh, I appreciate the, the reference to, of the uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, because that is a, a peculiar type of, of uh, campaign that, that sort of bridges the commercial space and the political space and that we have these fights for government contracts that do have this feeling of a zero-sum winner-take-all and they can get quite nasty and they're conducted, you know, people riding the metro in Washington are subjected to these ads on the metro for things they have, they, they have no clue what, the, what is being referred to unless they happen to be a Capitol Hill staffer. So it's this very strange Washington phenomenon of advertising. Well, if, if you're in Nebraska and you turn on TV at 5 a.m., you'll <laughs> see a farm show where the um, uh, the farm chemicals are saying, this is the one that gets nematodes, and our competitor doesn't get nematodes, <laughs> so this is the one you ought to buy. And, and they're pretty competitive. I mean, right. they, they take each other on because there are real product differences. Mm -hmm. And um, we really have to work hard to find the meaningful pro product right. differences. Right. So right behind you, Marie. Um, hi, Astrid Dorner with uh, Germany's Business Daily Handelsblatt. Um, Somebody earlier said that President Obama is in a difficult, tricky, tricky situa situation right now, known for mostly positive campaigns. But yourself, uh, you said that negative ads do work. So I was wondering, do you have any advice for his campaign? How should he react going forward? I, um, you asked, sir. I was asked in 2008 by Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and Chris Dodd's campaigns to, to work for those campaigns. And so I've thought about this a lot. I didn't do it, but I, I have thought about this a lot. And I think if Obama is in a good enough position that he can do some things that lift up America the way Morning in America did for Reagan, I think that could help him be more effective um, once he if he wins, if he knows he's going to win. Um, Reagan was in a position where it became pretty clear he was going to win again. And, and that kind of confidence is rare. If you're not as confident about that, then you're going to have to spend your money on the negative because you need to win. And, um, and so the long-term branding of being, having some upliftings Commercials would be fabulous for the whole country, does both it, sides. Does halftime in America work? <laughs> no, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it gets added, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. I think it's really interesting to think about the benefits of incumbency when you're President Obama. I think we talked a bunch about the special interest groups and all the different 
unaffiliated groups that will get to speak this cycle. And I think if I was advising President Obama, I would keep him totally positive. I think he is the president of the United States, a country coming out of a recession. You know, jobs is arguably getting better. You know, things are getting better across. And I would have him tell that story and only that t story and leave it for others to do the drawdown. I don't think there's any reason for him to get his hands dirty with that kind of debate. And I think that's some of the difficulty that we heard discussed when we were talking about the politics is that he may well do that. He may be able to stay positive, and that has nothing to do with what the Democratic machine will be choosing to say about whoever the nominee ends up being. So I do think from a branding perspective, I would do the same thing. To me, he has started to run and will run Morning in America times two this time. You know, he's a second term presidency, you know, who dealt with a tough first term, some tough situations, very much analogous to what Reagan faced, you know, both as he entered office, you know, at the two year mark, and now as the economy looks like it's turning around, it really may be a replay of that campaign. And I think he's got a strong brand with the hope and change that he ran on to pick back up and really focus in on. It'll be interesting to see what he does um, as the race tightens, very much like we talked about before, he may have to go negative. And I think that does have an impact on your competitor, but the reason we don't do it in commercial advertising is it has an impact on you. That blowback is unavoidable. The thing that's working in the favor, his favor now is that, as someone said earlier, it's that sliver of voters who don't already know what they're going to do. And they can be influenced by positive advertising too. It is a temptation to preach to the choir, and the choir is pissed off at that other side. And so you want to go after that other side. And um, there's that strong internal feeling of that. And, um, but if you're only going after that sliver of voters who will make the difference, um, it's possible that you could do, go a long way with positive advertising, I think. Some, some good pro bono advice. It's interesting, though, mm -hmm. the extent to which candidates are going to be able, I think, going forward, to retain this arm's length relationship with their unaffiliated supporters. Increasingly, we're seeing, we've seen this already in this cycle, you know, Newt Gingrich will demand of Mitt Romney, you know, tell your people to stop it. And, and you, to the point where Mitt, Rom Mitt Romney said, well, if there's anything in there that's inaccurate, uh, yes, I, sh I will, but I'm not so sure. And I haven't seen the ads. Of course, then he went on to say what was in the ads. But, yeah. but uh, you know, this, 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 this sort of, uh, narrative, it's not quite a legal fiction, but this narrative fiction that, well, I can't control what my support, we've seen it in past election cycles too. It would be, it would be nice, as, as you suggest, Jamie, if the candidate can pretend that there's no blowback from any of the independent expenditures. I just, it'll be really an interesting thing to look to see going forward if that actually proves to be the case. It feels to me like it hurts overall candidates' authenticity. So we ask these guys to be real and be honest with us and we ask them to pretend that their biggest donor, their whole careers, you know, by the time they get to be running for the presidency, these guys have backed them in 10 cycles, 20 years, and we ask them to pretend they have no idea what that person is doing, and they would never stoop to talking to them. So I think we've enshrined in law right. this really weird behavior that we ask for our most senior candidates, and then they are left to play the part. You know, that legally that he cannot turn and say, Adelson, turn that ad off, you know, that would, that would violate the law. So it's a really weird structure for their brands versus what the law asks them right. to do. Let's take one more question. Sorry. Here in the front. Uh, Chuck Schroeder, former Doyle Dane Birnbach copywriter and now a senior creative people. Um, one of the things that, that I was really kind of glad to hear you guys say, um, and meaning no offense if uh, Mike, the uh, research guy, is uh, still here, well, hey, whatever. Um, he made a point that um, advertising wouldn't really affect the outcome of an election. And uh, I, to frame that, you know, from our perspective, from where we come from, the research guys were always people who came into a meeting with reams of information. They were always very smart guys. And a creative person would take one page out of that massive stack of information and say, I like this. It would infuriate them, demean them, and make them feel as though all that tremendous work they put in was to not. So you've just said, and I want to make sure that we underscore, uh, underscore the point, that um, good advertising persuades. And that this sliver you're talking about, uh, Ken, is, is persuadable. And um, if you could elaborate slightly on that where you think that might have worked, 
Um, I, think, I think the challenge for Obama specifically will be getting the people out to vote who voted last time. Because now that he is um, attacked a lot by, by every part of the spectrum, from liberal to conservative, I think it, he has to inspire people that were inspired last time to go out and vote for this different looking, different sounding kind of candidate. And he's no longer as unusual in the position. And um, the people on the left have taken some of the luster off of him. So he needs to restore that kind of luster and that kind of um, thing. You know, nothing will work better for him than he, if he gets some joy in people's hearts. If he can go back to the inauguration speech or the speech he gave in Chicago the night he uh, won the election, that's the kind of spirit that will drive people out again. I also think that a lot of the, the positive stuff he ran in the 08 cycle is what got him to win the presidency. I think he did an awesome job of rebutting Republican attempts to make him the other and make him seem something outside or something strange or something foreign. And he ran positive ads, but positive ads that reinforced his family, reinforced his Americanness. And I think that that, I think TV has a way of bringing people into your home and creating a familiarity. And I think his advertising helped create that familiarity with him to let his message land. So I, I think advertising is hugely powerful. I think advertising at its best pushes you the way you're leaning. It reinforces a perception that you want to see or that you think to be somewhat true. That was why Swift Boat Veterans for Truth was so deadly for Kerry. You felt like there was something a little wishy-washy. You didn't know, you know, he had stood before Congress. Should we treat him as a war hero? Was there something suspect? And they pushed on that point. But it was already in the public persona. And I think that's where advertising, both for brands and politicians, is awesome. It can help cement a perception that lingers in people's minds. The hardest thing to do in any advertising is if you've got to create a brand new perception or a brand new behavior. But that kind of lean, which is most of political advertising, I think is ready-made for television advertising. Thank you. And unfortunately, we do need to wrap up now. I'd like to thank you.